we can go ahead and start recording the video now. All right, uh, how's everyone doing? All right. Doing well, made it, experiment three. So this one will be a little bit shorter because we're splitting it up into two weeks. So um, before we get started, I was going to do maybe like a little bit of an icebreaker. So we'll do uh, a little thing called two truths and a lie. So I'm gonna get you into breakout rooms and you all are gonna give about two truths and a lie to your group members. And then we'll come back from those breakout rooms and I'd like a volunteer from each room to give the best lie that they heard. And then we, we can get back together and we'll get started on this experiment. Um, so as an example, uh, my mine would be, uh, I don't know, um, I have four different species of pets. I'm 32 and I have a six month old at home who's just starting to crawl. Anyone guess what the lie of those three are? Definitely not 32. Not 32. Well, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Do I look older <laughs> or younger? The right answer is younger, right? Yeah, <laughs> younger. Yeah, younger than 32. That, that was a lie, you got it. All right, so let me go ahead and start out some breakout rooms. Um, and I'll kind of move people around so that everyone is in a room kind of equally. And then I'll get, I don't know, two, three minutes and we'll get back. Let's see. Go ahead and start with that. How's the family life going, Daniel? I'm exhausted. I'm Is she so sleeping tired. through the night? No, she has like three or four hour. But it's just like, I can't get anything done during the day because I don't have any daycare. So it's 24 seven trying to That's keep fair. entertained. Yeah. At least you don't have to be doing too much right now other than taking care of her and Tiang, right? Yeah, I have this, I'm grading for this, and then uh, I still have group meetings every week, and I'm doing some uh, I'm doing some DFT work for the project oh, on top nice. of that. And Which I just Which of projects are you on? I'm on the carbon monoxide one. Oh, okay, That's, I knew that. And then he had me write up an abstract, so I'm submitting an abstract to do a poster at ACS this year. Wait, that's awesome. Yeah, we'll see if it gets accepted, but I submitted it. <laughs> That's still exciting, though. Um, all right. So, uh, experiment three, we're doing a two-step synthesis of ions. Uh, the very first step is these pseudo-ions. And so, this will be kind of a short reaction, and we are just going to be doing this condensation type reaction. So um, what is the first step of this reaction? Let's go ahead and just kind of remind ourselves what's happening here. Feel free to just unmute yourselves and, and chime in. What do we think? Anybody? Uh, is the first step an aldol reaction? So we are doing an aldol reaction. So what I've shown here is kind of the overall, right, from the citrals to the pseudoionones. So what's the very first step of this mechanism? We're removing a hydrogen, right? 
yeah, so which one are we going to be removing? So if we go ahead and kind of draw one of these. Five, six, Right, so we have our starting citral. Mm -hmm. We have acetone, we have sodium methoxide, and we're in ethanol. So what's happening here first? Uh, well, we're gonna be removing a hydrogen, I think from the far left end, but it's gonna be um, that alkene right there, I think. From, you're saying from this end over here? Yeah. So what happens in an aldol type mechanism? Let's think about what happens in an aldol mechanism, the condensation. Uh, you wanna deprotonate the acidic hydrogen, the alpha one. All right, we're gonna make some kind of nucleophile and it's gonna attack our aldehyde here. So if we want to do a deprotonation of our acetone here, so we're gonna take from our base, which is our sodium ethoxide, grab one of our hydrogens, we could draw arrows that look like that. Alternatively, Dr. Binder showed, just showing the lone pair on this, on uh, the end of the acetone there on that carbon. So we could think of drawing something that looks like this, right? And now that's our nucleophile. And so now what's going to happen? So we've generated this enol. And what's our next step going to be? It's going to attack the, the enol is going to attack the um, citral. Yeah, so let me go ahead and I'll just get rid of this. Let me move it. Like that. All right, so now these are our reacting species. Electrons can come down. And attack our aldehyde. So at this point, I'm only going to draw kind of the end part of the molecule here. We can draw back in everything over here later. And we can go ahead and do something that looks like that. There's the rest of the molecule there. Everything looking okay so far? What would our next step be? The negative charge is going to attack the hydrogen on the ethanol. Yeah, so we have ethanol around. So that's where we can pick up a proton from. All right, we just generate more ethoxide, which can go back and do the deprotonation of acetone. So now at this point, we have something that looks like that, right? What do we think is going to happen now? You deprotonate the alpha carbon. Deprotonate the alpha carbon. So you are talking about pulling one of these protons for the base, right? Yes. So our base, again, we have sodium ethoxide around.
and this is going to do that E1CB mechanism that we talked about in the lecture. And now what's going to happen? You push the electrons down from oxygen and then you have hydroxide leave. Yeah, yeah. we can take our electrons down over our loss of OH. And you could also alternatively draw that red arrow going to like a proton on ethanol that last red arrow. And now I'm going to draw the final one with, with everything on there. To get to one of our pseudo ions, right? We're starting with a mixture of citrals. So we're gonna get a mixture of the pseudo ions. Okay, any questions on that so far? And kind of before we just jump into actually setting up the reactions, any questions on this lab? Okay, um, let's see, Kristen, are you guys uh, ready? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, yeah uh, I think Jared's all yeah. ready to go. All right, let's see. Cool. All right, Jared, why don't you off. walk us through the experimental setup okay. of this aldol condensation. So, um, I already did a couple of things, but I don't know if you, so you can see we have just a stir bar. We have a ice bath. We added a bunch of salt to it to try to lower the uh, uh, lower the the, um, the the freezing point of the ice so we can get temperatures uh, lower than zero. So we're trying to make that negative eight. And we're pretty close. I have about minus six, about as low as I can get it. So I'm going to go with it at minus six at the moment. And then we have a Erlenmeyer here, which I've locked in, and two and a quarter grams of citral and uh, eleven and a quarter gra uh, milliliters of acetone. And we have those stirring. And so at this step, um, we're going to slowly add that sodium uh, ethoxide, um, like Daniel was saying, to remove that alpha hydrogen. So we're going to do that right now. So we're going to do that dropwise, and 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 uh, for everyone else, why do we need to add this in dropwise? Any thoughts? For the class, why would we need to add in this base as slowly as possible? So we don't mess it up. So we don't mess it up. Fair enough. Oh, yeah. What would be uh, maybe a more detailed reason? Uh, we don't want to uh, uh, deprotonate too quickly. And why is that? What happens if we have a bunch of that enol around? It won't have time to. Uh, Ketolize, I believe. I believe that's what it's called. So what else is in our reaction? When we generate that enol, what else is in that reaction flask? Right? List out some of the other things that are in there right now. Uh, acetone. We have acetone in there. And what else? Citral. We have the citral. We have the aldehyde and we have a ketone. Right? So if we generate a bunch of the nucleophile, 
we might start to see some self condensation. We might still see that enol react with acetone if we build up too much of the concentration of that enol. So we want to add it in slowly, let it react with the aldehydes. So we're not building up too much of that enol. So we cool it down, we add it in slowly, and we were getting reaction with that aldehyde. Okay, so we're not going to sit here and, and watch all this. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and pause this. Um, and we're going to start talking about some NMR stuff and uh, your NMR worksheets so we don't have to sit here and watch uh, and Jera lose his mind as his arm starts to burn. <laughs> um, just in case anyone is interested, they make machines for this. So if you end up working in a lab and your lab doesn't have a syringe pump, immediately ask for a syringe pump. It'll make your life so much easier. A syringe pump is basically just a... Uh, a, a really well controlled pump. So it's usually, depending on how fancy you get it, it can come pre-programmed with the just disposable syringes that you just buy, um, you know, with all the dimensions of those syringes. And you just say, hey, I'm using this syringe and this volume, and I want you to add this volume over X amount of minutes. Because standing here for any more than 10 minutes can be <laughs> a real pain in the butt. Um, one of the synthesis in my current project it's a 30 minute dropwise edition of a oh couple God. mils of butyl lithium. And there's no way I'm going to sit there for 30 minutes and be able to accurately uh, drop in, you know, at a consistent rate, the butyl lithium to the reaction. And so it's, it's kind of the same idea, even with this reaction, right? You could use, um, you know, Jared could really try to sit here and do the math ahead of time of how quickly he needs to keep those drops in to keep that kind of a constant drop, but that's a little hard to do. Um, so definitely, uh, they have machines for this. If you ever end up in a lab, and you need to do a longwise addition, so we'll we'll come back to you, Jarrah. Cool. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. So I wanted to go to some of the NMR stuff that we have uh, coming up. So if we quickly go over to here, I'm going to go ahead. I'm too impatient for this. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and mute the lab. All right, so we're just going to kind of talk through this first one that we've done here. I'm going to go ahead and just pause the recording as well. So basically, what I did was I went ahead and put in my product, which is up here, and then I added BME, which is going to be this clear aqueous layer down here. So right. I went- The BME should be on top oh, of Oh, sorry, that, that's the BME, and then this was- what else Your water, so we already did the HCL quench now. Yes. So I yeah, added so the just... HCL, added the BME, and then added in some more water, and now we're in the set funnel. Yeah, so then I just went ahead and labeled this little beaker as my aqueous waste container, and then I'll have my organic layer over here. So then just to help the flow a little bit, I went ahead and took off the top. And then, uh -oh. here we go. Oh, is that good? Yep. And then I'm just going to go ahead and at first I'll just go ahead and have it flow out quickly until it gets closer. And then I want to just go ahead and slow it down so that I don't lose too much of my product there. Okay, and then I'm going to go ahead and switch it over to my organic layer beaker. And let that flow out. And then I'm going to give that just a couple seconds to go ahead and get all of that product out because there's still, as you can see, a little bit left in and it's still dripping out a little bit slowly. So I'll take this chance to go ahead and get my next solvent. All right, in the chat, does anyone, uh, anyone uh, have an idea as to why we added the HCL from before? All right, so we had that dark brown reaction. And right, so if I go back to it, right, so we had this reaction. We took 
that, we added some HCL, HCL to that and then added water. Why did we add the HCL before doing the extraction? To neutralize the reaction. Yeah, we need to neutralize that reaction, right? We had a bunch of sodium ethoxide in there, really basic. So we've added in some HCl to neutralize our reaction. We've extracted it. We've collected that organic layer. And then now what are we gonna do to that organic layer after that first water wash? Isn't it being thrown out because of the BME? Uh, the, the organic layer. So there's BME in the organic layer, and then our product is in the organic layer as well, oh. right? Oh, okay. That makes so we want to make sure we put our water back in our step funnel, and we're going to add a couple mils of uh, BME to the water. Kristen, did you do that already? Kristen? Sorry, what was that, Daniel? Did you already uh, do extra extractions from the water with more our BME? Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Do extra extractions? Oh. Uh I think your tablet froze, Kristen. Hi, sorry, my tablet just froze and quit. I'm okay. back. Um, okay. I just went ahead and added the organic layer back in, and then here is my BME that I'm going to add. I went ahead and got the 10 milliliters, so then I'll just add my first five mils. For, and then, uh, hold, hold on. Uh, oh, um, sorry. Sorry, let's spotlight you again. Uh, so you, you don't need to add BME to your organic layer already. There's already BME in there. Out my... So we're gonna wash, we're washing the aqueous layer. So you need to put your aqueous layer in the set funnel. Oh. You're gonna add some BME to that. And that's just to extract out any last organics from the aqueous layer. So if there's any kind of residual organic -y stuff just kind of stuck in the water, we're gonna add more organic. So we're gonna add more BME to that to help just kind of extract out anything that's residual in the water layer and make sure we get all of our product in this uh, organic layer. So this was that water layer. We're putting it back in. I would move that beaker out from underneath that set funnel. So, cause that's your organic layer. We don't want to accidentally get water in that. Back to my aqueous layer beaker. Yep. So now we're going to add a couple mils of BME. We're going to add five mils of BME or so. I'm just going kind of slowly so I can try and get everything off the sides so I can. Kind That's of okay, because you're going to invert it there. anyway. You're going to invert it anyway, so that'll kind of help wash the edges. Okay, and then as you can see, there's definitely still. Looks like your screen froze again. I love campus Wi Fi. This is how I expected our first lab lecture to go. Yeah. Sorry, there for some go. reason mine keeps on quitting. Um, so I'm just gonna plug it in. Hopefully that will solve the problem right here. Okay, but as I was saying, you can see that I still have a little bit of that product in there. You can tell by that faint yellow color that's still in the organic layer up here that um, it just was created by the BME that I added. So then I'm just gonna do the same thing that I did before where I went ahead and 
took out the aqueous layer. And once I've taken that out, I'm going to go ahead and put my organic layer beaker underneath here and add that first five mils of BME to it. And then, and then we're going to do that one more time to your water layer. Back to my aqueous layer. And I'm making sure that this is closed so that it doesn't fall out. Adding in my aqueous. And then replacing the aqueous beaker back underneath my set funnel. And now I'm adding the rest of the BME. Again, just going slowly to try and get everything off the sides so I can. Okay, and then hopefully you can tell from the video that this layer, this time, there's much less yellow. It's a very, very faint. If you can't see the two layers, it starts about here. And there is still a little faint yellow in there. So I know there's still a little bit more of my product. So what I'm gonna do to just try and get as much as I can is I'm just gonna invert and vent a few times. And then I'll let it settle into two layers again. Okay, while this is settling, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and grab the sodium chloride that's needed for the next step. All right, so we're gonna combine those organic layers and then we're going to add in a sodium chloride solution, so just salt water. And does anyone have an answer as to why we're gonna add in salt water to this? We've already had water in there, why are we now adding in salt water? Any thoughts? Why would we add water when we just got rid of water? What's special about this one? Uh, ionized. So it's ionized. So what is that going to do? How is that going to help? Help separate the uh, polar and non-polar. Yeah, we're going to kind of polarize that water even more. So we're going to make that layers separate even more. We're going to really kind of extract out any residual water from the organic layer, any salts from those organic layers, and really try to push them into the water layer. Uh, sometimes if you're reading literature, you'll see this just called like a brine wash. In this case, we're not doing a full on brine. Um, or sometimes you'll see it called like a drying wash. So you can add in brine and that really kind of helps pull out some more water from that organic layer. And so you have an even more dry organic layer before we go on to the next step, which is drying our organic layer as well. And we add in that mag sulfate. So here are the combined organic layers that Daniel was just talking about. So that's from all my washes and from my experiment that I did before this. So that should contain all my products. So again, just making sure this part is closed so that my product doesn't just fall right through so I lose all of it. And then I'll go ahead and add that back in. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add my sodium chloride to my organic beaker to just try and get out anything that's left in there. Swirl that around a little bit. Okay, 
Okay, and then I'll go ahead and add it to my organic layer. And I'll go ahead and replace my aqueous speaker underneath. Go ahead and put the cap on. And then again, just do a little invert, invert, and bent. I'm just gonna do that twice. And then put it back in. And then I'm going to go ahead and wait for those layers to separate as much as possible. Okay, and then once again, I'm going to go ahead and put the aqueous layer into my little aqueous layer waste beaker. And I definitely want to slow down as I get closer so that I don't put my organic layer into my aqueous beaker on accident by going too quickly. Now that that's all taken out, it's all just the organic layer now. I'm going to go ahead and replace my organic beaker underneath my set funnel and put my product in there. I'm going to let it go nice and slowly because I want to make sure that it doesn't get stuck on the sides of my set funnel as I'm taking it out. Again, these are all just places where I could be losing a little bit of product, which is why our percent yield might not be as high as we expect it to be because it's easy to lose a little bit of product in steps like this, especially when we're taking it out of speakers and putting it back in. It's just very easy to get it stuck on like the sides of containers. So I just wanna be careful to minimize that loss as much as I can. If you're worried about loss like that too as well, you can always just kind of add in a little bit more organic. So after all of this is drained out, you could take some more BME, a couple mils, add that in, switch it around, drain that out as well to really kind of wash your glassware and get all that product out. <clears throat> so after this step, um, Kristen is gonna add um, some mag sulfate to this organic layer. And why would we wanna add some mag sulfate to this or magnesium sulfate, any guesses? I already mentioned it earlier, but let's go ahead and get another guess. You can dry it. Yeah, so we're just gonna dry that organic layer. So right, so that mag sulfate's gonna grab onto that water, but stay a solid, so we're gonna filter that out. And how do we know when we've added enough magnesium sulfate? All right, how do I know that I've added enough that it's dry? What's a good visual indicator? Does it start clumping together? So clumping together means it's grabbing the water. But if you're seeing clumps and nothing else, how do you know that you've gotten all of the water? So we're going to keep adding it until something happens, right? We're going to add a little bit. We're going to see clumps, swirl, add some more. It's going to clump some more, swirl. And then when do we know that we've added enough magnesium sulfate? when it's no longer clumping. When it's no longer clumping, clump. right? Once the clumping is done, we start to see some free flowing powder and that means we've kind of grabbed all the water. So I actually have my magnesium sulfate right, right here. And then I probably won't have to use all of that. I just want to go ahead and bring over enough and then if I have extra, I can give it to Jira. So kind of the easiest way to do this is just, just go ahead and add a little bit and see just kind of what, just what you're seeing there. And it's clearly that is turning into one big clump at the bottom. So I'm going to want to go ahead and add a fair amount more. 
that doesn't even look close to ready. Okay, and then I'm not sure if you guys can see this right here, but so I'm going to go ahead and start spinning. And then when I stop, it doesn't all just go into one clump over here. There are actually parts of it that are still floating around in the actual beaker, which is how I know that it's no longer sucking up that extra aqueous layer. So I can, so that just tells me that I've dried it out as much as I can and I don't want to put in any more because that could cause it to just start sucking up stuff that I actually want to keep if I just It's also just a waste. There's no need to use more also, than we need to use. Yeah, be careful with your, with your solvents and everything. So now what I'm going to do is go ahead and take this over to my little cotton filter over here. What's the setup we have there, Kristen? Uh, can you see it? Like, okay, yep. so what I have here is my glass filter. And I went ahead and put some cotton in there. And for this reaction, I went ahead and packed the cotton pretty tightly just because the magnesium sulfate is so thin that I don't want it to just fall through the cotton filter. So if I was using something that was like a thicker drying agent, then I could just go ahead and use more of a loosely packed one. But in this case, I'm not going to. So I'm just going to stir that up one more time to try and get everything out when I filter. And also, to take note of this, I already pre-weighed my round bottom. And I went ahead and chose the 100 milliliter one because you want to make sure that the liquid that you're putting in here doesn't go up more than halfway. And I have about 40 milliliters, so 100 mil round bottom seemed like the right choice. So now I'm just going to go ahead and start my gravity filter. So pre-tearing anything you're using in Organic Lab is always just a good habit to get into. It makes your life so much easier, especially when you have less product than you thought you would have. You put it on the road of app, you evaporate it down, and rather than trying to scrape it out of the round bottom to get a yield, you can now just weigh that round bottom and then see what your yield is. Now, if it's in there, if we're going to get some oils, we could do a liquid transfer to get it into something that we already pre-teared, but it's easier just to kind of have it pre-teared already. Okay, well, it doesn't seem like anything more is coming out of my beaker. I'm going to try and go ahead and get out all that magnesium sulfate just in case there's any of my product layer in there to go ahead and try and get it through the filter. And Christian, you don't have to do this here, but if you wanted to at this point too, you could also add in a couple more mils of BME to that beaker, swirl that around, and then pour that into the funnel as well. And then that would help wash any more organics down into the round bottom as well. Yeah. And also, if I was worried about diluting it too much, um, I could also just take out a few mils of this, put it back in, and run it through. Uh, but well, we don't need to worry too much about diluting it. Um, it'd be more about washing the product down into the round bottom. Uh, diluting it's not too big a deal because we're going to concentrate it on the road of app anyway. Oh, true. Okay. And. I think I'm actually ready to start road wrapping. So. And uh, for the class, what is the purpose of the road What are we going to do? Are we going to use a road in, uh, maybe Chris can answer this for me, 8L, 8M, the other yeah, labs, so do we use a road 
they had to, most of them learned how to use it in 8L, I think, in 8M. We mainly did it for them, but they've definitely seen okay. it a fair amount. All right, well then, uh, what is the roadmap doing? What are we gonna do with that roadmap? It concentrates the product or your stuff. Oh, here. How is it doing that? Does it dry it or something? Yeah, so it's, it's gonna dry it, but what does that mean? How, how are we drying it? Does it remove the solvents? It's gonna remove the solvent, yeah. And any ideas on, on how it's able to remove the solvent? You use heat to vaporize it. Use heat to vaporize it. So there's going to be heat involved as well. But we're also hooking it up to a vacuum. What's, what's happening there? So when you're thinking of a rotobat, Think of kind of like a really fancy distillation machine with a really high surface area. So in this case, we're going to put under vacuum. It's going to reduce vapor pressure on top, right? You're going to lower your boiling point of your solvent in this case. So everything in there, our solvent's going to be our lowest boiling point uh, liquid in there. We're also going to heat it a little bit, and that's just because during the evaporation process, you have evaporative cooling. So we want to keep the actual round bottom warm so it doesn't cool down, because as that cools down, then it gets harder for your solvent to evaporate and condense over. So we keep that in a warm bath. And then uh, you pull a vacuum and then your solvent evaporates. It goes over to the left-hand side. So in this case, as our viewpoint on the far side there, it's going to hit, in this case, it's just gonna be ice water that's going through the condenser. So it'll condense on that and drop down into the collection flask. So here we're just distilling off our solvent. Maybe. And Jara, are, is your reaction done now? Oh, we, we can't hear anything you're saying over there, Jara. Okay, so I haven't. Um, but, um, I was going to wait to do that for you guys because. Uh, there's a color change, or should be a color change. Yeah, your reaction's done now, right, Jerry? Yeah, 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 and that's totally done. Okay, so we'll, 30 minutes. We'll, while Kristen is uh, distilling off solvent and drying her reaction down, because that'll take a bit, uh, we're gonna hop over to Jera, just because we missed that HCL edition, so we can see kind of some of that color change as we quench that reaction. Cool, all right, so yeah, this reaction has been going for uh, well, to over over 20 minutes now, so we're we're good. We're good and plenty. But we're gonna go ahead and neutralize that reaction. Can we see everything okay? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Everything looks good. Okay. So we're neutralizing it, and so we're gonna add the HCO uh, again, drop wise. Um, there is base. Hopefully, we get a nice color change. Of course, anytime we're adding, you know, acids to bases or bases to acids, um, we want to do it slowly because um, it's a exothermic. But luckily, it's also in ice, so that's good too. I don't know if you can hear, um, I'm hearing the, uh, the stir bar starting to struggle. Um, we are expecting some change in uh, viscosity as well. So I think that's what I'm hearing. Oh, there we go. Awesome. Now it's starting to kind of look like a titration. 
which right. in a sense it is. Also start seeing some uh, chunks form. I'm not sure if you can see that. So that was all of the acid added. Yeah, so it's about three mils. And then um, why don't you go ahead and start working that up? Right. So bring it up and show everyone. So much different color. There was some precipitate forming, but I don't see it now. But we'll see. So you go ahead. Uh, I'm going to switch back to Kristen, and then maybe we'll actually break off and do some GC's talk before uh, until her stuff is dry. So in the background, if you don't mind just working that one out. Cool. Sounds good. Things look like they're drying at all, Kristen? Um, yes, they actually look like they're going quite well. So I'm actually going to go ahead and bring it over here so you guys can see it a little bit better. So I'm not sure you guys can tell, but I do have about half the liquid I had in there before. And a good way to tell that this is working the way I would like it to is there is some of that solvent that's coming off over here. And um, before what was happening was I could kind of see it dripping off down here. So I know that my solvent is coming off, which is definitely what I want to see. And unfortunately that's all there is really is to see. The rest okay. will probably take a little bit longer. I'm actually going to grab some more ice. Yeah, um, we'll let that go for a little bit. I'm going to talk about some GC because uh, as, as soon as that's done, I'll have you just write down uh, a, a mass yield real fast. We can calculate the yield later. Just write it down. Give it to them later. Um, okay, perfect. And then we'll start a GC of that. Yes, yeah, sounds good. Um, let me know if you want me to show the standard GC so they can look at how it works if they can't remember. Of the standard? Yeah, I or, was going to go ahead and do, or of uh, the starting material, sorry. Oh, the starting material? Yeah, um, oh, we just need to, well, we'll just show one GC, either of your product or of the starting material, whatever works for you. Um, okay, actually, I'll go ahead and do that. Why don't you get prepared to just run a GC of the starting material? Okay. Um, and then I'm gonna just switch over to my screen real fast and we'll come back to you in like two minutes, three minutes, whatever Perfect. you need. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, um, for everyone else, if you need a little refresher on GC, um, definitely go back to your 8L lectures. Um, this will be expected in this lab is kind of doing the full analysis of the GC. So um, Kristen and Jara, they are going to, um, you know, get the GCs for us and we'll make sure to put these PDFs up on Canvas. Um, but if you go back to the ADL uh, website, I believe this was lecture three. Yeah, lecture lecture three. Um, uh, you can go ahead and review some of the GC stuff that we need to calculate. So one of those is uh, retention time. And the other one is going to be the peak integration. So in this case, how many peaks are we expecting to see for the starting material. Any thoughts? Is it 
Four. Four peaks? And what would those four peaks possibly be? Are you asking like the groups? So like just the starting material, the citrol, if I took that oil and I put it in the GC, what are we kind of expecting? Um, a spike nearby where the alcohols would be, where the alcohol group like gives off, right? So on GC, what are we looking at? And so if we go back, right, we kind of take our sample, we inject it, so gas chromatography. What are we doing? Looking at boiling points? Kind of looking at boiling points. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have some kind of graph, kind of like here in this red, blue, yellow, green, right? And you're going to get peaks. The peak that comes off first, that's the one that made it through the column first, or the lowest boiling point. It made it through the machine and reads out first peaks that came out later are going to be the, uh, sorry, the, the lower boiling points come off first, higher boiling points will come off later. So in, uh, in this case, um, what are we expecting to see? So on these red, blue, uh, yellow, and green, the right-hand side is, um, going to be the stuff coming off later. The left-hand side is the stuff that kind of came off first. So what are we expecting? The question, where do you get the page you're looking at? Right now? Uh, this is on the 8L website from the Acrochem website. So if you go back to 8L, tab 8L, and in lecture three, there's kind of a review on gas chromatography. And you should have access to that when it's still up there. More, most importantly from this page, I just wanted to have you see the retention time calculation and the peak integration or percent composition. All right, so if we, if we put the citrals in, so it's just the pure citrals, we should expect to see an air spike at the beginning. And then we should expect to see another peak come off with is the citrals. Uh, I don't remember what the boiling points are between the two of them. I think they're pretty close, um, if not the same. It just says approximately 75. So the, those peaks will probably come off as one, so you won't be able to distinguish the, between the two citrals. So you'll see an air peak kind of coming off. Let's see if I can uh, highlight this real fast. So kind of in the same fashion here, you kind of have your trace. You'll have maybe one peak come off first, and then another peak come off later. And so this this first peak here will be kind of an air. We always inject a little bit of air bubble, and that's kind of like your starting point, right? So if you look. Over here, distance from air to sample is what we're going to use in our calculation. And then here will be your citrals. So you'll see that come off next. And so you'll have this GC trace, and then the other GC trace will be the product of this reaction. And in that case, you'll see a new peak, and it'll have a different retention time. You might see a little bit left over of the citrals. If the reaction didn't go to completion, you might see some more of the starting materials, a small peak at the same retention time, but then maybe you'll see a new peak, right? Because it has a higher boiling point. Now we're going from 75 to 120. So we'll have a new big peak here. So in this case, um, You might get a graph that kind of looks like an air peak, maybe some citrals, and then a new peak that should be the pseudo ionones. And so uh, definitely go back to this page, kind of remind yourself of the GC for calculating retention times and also doing the peak integration, because you'll need to do that for the post lab questions. So here, the peak integration, the peak area is height times the width at half height. So your WH2 is half this height, the width there, and then uh, 
you have the height, which is right there in the middle of that peak. And you can just use a ruler for this. Okay, let's go ahead and see if we can get back to Kristen if she's ready. Yes, hi, I'm all ready. Okay, so what I have here is just my GC needle that I'll be using to inject my sample. And I'm just gonna go ahead and clean it off with acetone that I have right here just by pulling it up into my needle. And I wanna pull it up all the way to get it entirely clean. And I'll go ahead and squirt out. And that way, if there's anything left over, either in, my, in the tip of the needle or where my actual sample will be, then that way it's just kind of been fully cleaned out. And so I know that if I see any extraneous peaks, it's probably something that's gone wrong with my experiment rather than something that was left over. And then I'm gonna go ahead and come over to my standard. And then I found that the easiest way to do this is, sorry, I'm actually gonna pour a little bit of the sample into a small container. And that way I don't have any problems with contamination. So I don't want any acetone in my uh, standard bottle because then no one else could use it. So, in this little container, I just put some of the standard of the citrals into here. So I'll go ahead and fill my needle up with my standard. And then I wanna just go ahead and squirt that out again too, just to kind of clear out any leftover acetone if there is any. And I found the easiest way to not get air bubbles is to pull it up nice and slowly until it's at about two microliters. And then what I can do is I can go ahead and lower it down until I reach that point two that I want to inject. So just so it's clear that our starting material has been diluted in acetone. So we don't want to inject just pure starting material because you'll just get one giant peak. And then I don't you guys probably can't see this because it's all the way up here, but that two that point two is all the way at the top right here. So you definitely can't see that, but I've lowered it down and made sure there were no air bubbles. So the next thing I'll do is I'll slowly pull this out until it reaches that full height that it came in. And I unfortunately did get one air bubble, so what I'm gonna do is just do it one more time. Okay, and now I have an air bubble with sample. Um, hopefully you guys remember what that looks like, but basically I pulled it up and I can see that there's my a little bit of sample at the top here and the rest is filled with air. And then what I'll do is go ahead and turn off my chart and then I wanna go ahead and zero it just so that I have that starting line ready. So to do that, all I had to do was come over here and then I just turn this little zero knob and then that created a line right there. So now back over here. So to inject for this one, I'm just going to put my needle in right here. So I went ahead and put in and then I'm just gonna go ahead and restart it. And then I just wanna inject it as fast as possible in one swift movement, so just inject and pull up the needle and wait for the GC to start running. Um, it's at a pretty low speed, so it probably will take a little while. But to show you guys what I'm looking for, 
there are standards up here. And these diagrams are especially important because they tell you the temperature of the column, the inlet temperature, the column length, um, the flow rate, the sample size, and the chart speed. And most of those things are things that you will need for calculations later on. And we'll make sure to take a photo of just that and upload it as well. Sorry, what'd you say? I said we'll make sure to take a photo of just the the um, the speed and everything and upload that to Canvas as well. Oh yeah. Right now I'm I've just seen my air peak. So that would be my air peak right there. And looking at the standard from the air to the alpha and beta is a little while. Um, so those are the ions. We're not expecting yeah. to see that one. We're expecting oh, to yeah, see I was the just, I was just going to say, um, the citral should appear before that because they do yeah. have a lower boiling temp. So I know about in the area that I'm looking for. So hopefully it won't be too much longer. I'm actually going to go ahead and check on my road about right now. So bring that up here. Okay, so looking at it, I'm, what I'm going to do is go ahead and pull it out a little bit so that you guys can see it. And I'll stop the spinning for a second. So looking at it now, I have gotten rid of a lot of the extraneous solvent, but there's still probably a fourth of it left. So I'm going to go ahead and lower it back into the water. I want it spinning pretty quickly. My vacuum is already on full back. So what I'm going to do now is just go ahead and add a little bit of ice, and hopefully that will help speed along the process. Oh, sorry, I'm actually, I'm adding ice to the water bucket that is in the sink over here because that connects directly to the water that's in this column and that helps to get rid of your solvent a little bit faster if that's a little bit colder. So overall, the product here is gonna basically look just like that. It'll kind of be an oil and it'll have that yellow color um, and then GC data. So at this point, we don't need to, to show the rest of it. So um, that's, that's pretty much the end. So you were expecting kind of a yellow oil as the product. Um, Kristen will weigh out everything and make sure that that is uploaded. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the reaction or stop the recording for now for this first part of the synthesis of ions.